interested to your in your talk tonight about the uh, the Indian dipole and um, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, just yeah. Nerali, just before you start, I'll just let everyone know that it's now being recorded so that we can share this with everyone who isn't able to dial in tonight. <laughs> Nerali's presentation will also be available afterwards. We were hoping to send it out with the email and unfortunately it was too big for our system to send. So we'll work that out um, tomorrow morning and get it through to all of you. Um, and any questions, please just pop them in the chat box so that we don't have people trying to speak over the top of each other and then we'll get on with it. Thank you so much, Nerali. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the, um, the invitation to, to speak to you. Um, it's, um, the, the farming community is a community that I haven't um, had a chance to, to speak to sort of as a group um, before. I, I do, I have had some experience in working with governments to um, convey scientific information to them. Um, but the, the work that we do um, is, is aimed at trying to understand what um, causes variability, um, particularly in Australia's rainfall. Um, and so we're very conscious that the information that we're providing, the, the research that we're doing, is quite relevant for your com communities, or we, we hope that what we're doing is relevant and useful for your communities. So it's, it's, um, it's really nice to be able to speak to you today. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is the Indian Ocean Dipole um, and specifically the work that um, I've been doing with um, quite a large team of people to, to look at um, ways that we can reconstruct um, the variability of this climate phenomenon back in time, back over the last millennium, um, and to, to then use that to give context to our observational records and our, our climate model projections um, of the Indian Ocean Dipole so that we can have more confidence in being able to, to see um, how this system behaves um, and how it's um, being altered um, now because of human caused climate change. Um, right, so um, I thought that um, I'd start um, on, on this very positive note actually, um, which is the, the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, it's the most re recent um, seasonal climate outlook. So the rainfall outlook um, for May to July um, and we can see Lots of areas of blue, so um, indicating that most of Australia um, has, a, has a good chance of exceeding um, the median rainfall that you'd expect for this time of year. Um, and the reason that I wanted to, to start here is that um, what you can see in this image um, is that rainfall patterns are really extending from the northwest of Australia and then sweeping across Australia down towards the southeast. Um, and just this, this visual here, I think. Um, already just by looking at that intuitively, you can see that this area to the northwest of Australia is a really important area when we think about where our rainfall comes from. Um, so that's, that's the starting point. Um, and just the, the text that goes along with this, um, saying that a warmer than usual Eastern Indian Ocean is that main influence that we're seeing on Australia's climate at the moment. Um, and because that ocean is warm, it's feeding um, moist, air into weather systems as they sweep across the country. So as we get these cold fronts traveling across the country, they're drawing down um, air from the northwest of Australia. And that air at the moment has a lot of moisture in it. And so that gives us a, an increased chance of getting rainfall. Um, so the Indian Ocean Dipole, um, some of you um, may have heard of this before, others may not. Um, it's, it's a similar kind of climate process to the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which I think probably most people have heard of, but the El Nino operates in the Pacific Ocean um, and the Indian Ocean Dipole is operating in, the, um, in the, the tropical Indian Ocean. So it's a natural climate process. Um, it has positive and negative phases. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about mostly tonight um, is the positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, so when we have a positive phase, that's when we have um, water that is cooler than usual to the northwest of Australia. And when we have that cool water to the northwest of Australia, um, we've got less evaporation happening over the ocean. And so the, the air that would be drawn down across Australia doesn't hold moisture um, or doesn't hold very much moisture. And so we have a reduced chance of rainfall um, in Australia when we have this positive 
um, in the ocean dipole. Um, that's what we saw in 2019. Um, and that was one of the, the contributors as to why um, Australia had its driest year on record in 2019. Um, these are just the maps from the Bureau of Meteorology, just showing the, the typical impacts that you would expect um, when you have one of these positive Indian Ocean dipole events. So we see the impact of these events in the winter and the spring. Um, and when we have a positive Indian Ocean dipole event, uh, we have drier than usual conditions um, and we have hotter than usual conditions, particularly across the southern parts of Australia and um, particularly focused in the southeast. Um, it's one thing that I just wanted to point out is that um, these climate processes don't operate in isolation. Um, so, so we've got the Indian Ocean dipole that's happening in the tropical Indian Ocean. We've got the El Nino phenomenon that's happening in the, um, in the um, tropical Pacific Ocean. Um, and those systems interact with each other, particularly um, in the Indonesian area. Um, and so when you have conditions, have El Nino conditions in the Pacific, um, you set up a, a situation where you're also more likely to have a positive Indian Ocean dipole event. So you can have these systems um, occurring independently, um, but there is a, 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 a high chance that you actually have them happening at the same time. And so when you have that situation, you actually sort of have this double whammy um, for Australia's rainfall in that you, you cut off one of your main moisture sources from the tropical Indian Ocean, but you're also cutting off um, that eastern source from the Pacific Ocean as well. And so when you have um, a positive Indian Ocean dipole event and an El Nino event at the same time, um, you have an even stronger um, effect on drying um, Australia, and particularly eastern Australia. So this is our um, observational record of the dipole mode index. So this is where we've got um, very good observations based on records of sea surface temperature from the east and the west um, tropical Indian Ocean. Um, so what you can see on here um, in, in red is where we go into having a positive Indian Ocean dipole event and dark red is an extreme positive Indian Ocean dipole event. So you can see a couple of spikes in the 1990s. So there's a, there was a strong event in 1994, um, another very large event in 1997. Um, and then you can see 2019 at the end of that, um, that time series. And so that's, that's the big event that we had last year. Um, and so something that I, that's quite import, important, I think, to point out um, in, in here is that the scientific community really only um, has been working or researching the Indian Ocean Dipole since 1999. And so that's when it was formally defined. And that was following those two big events in 1994 and 1997. Um, so our, our understanding of this system um, is, is not as good as our understanding for something like the El Nino, where we've been studying that for um, a few decades longer. Um, and also we've got very few of these big events to be able to study. So um, 2019, scientifically, that will give us a lot more information to be able to, to really understand more about the dynamics of this system. Uh, so one of the other important things um, to, to see with this figure is that when we have these positive events, they can be very strong. So like 1997, um, like 2019. Um, the negative events um, don't have that same potential. Um, so you can see the strongest event on record here um, for a negative event is 2016. Um, but the, the magnitude of those negative events isn't as strong as the positive events. Um, the negative events are still very important. And so in a negative phase, we've got warmer than usual water um, to the northwest of Australia. Um, when we have that warm water, we have a lot of evaporation over the ocean. Um, and so then when that air gets drawn down across Australia, um, it's holding a lot of moisture. And so you increase the, the chance of rain. Um, so these are your typical um, impacts of negative Indian Ocean dipole events. So you can see um, the, those um, wetter conditions um, across a lot of Australia, and particularly down into the southeast, um, and cooler temperatures as well in the winter and the spring. Um, right, so um, the, the negative events um, are 
very important in the Australian context. And this is some, so the, a, a relatively new way um, of thinking about the, the Indian Ocean dipole. Um, or oh, sorry, the Indian Ocean, or the, actually the, the effect, the influence of these climate systems um, on Australia. Um, and really sort of pointing to the importance of La Nina events and um, positive Indian Ocean dipole events um, in breaking um, drought. Um, so this is a rainfall time series um, for the southeast of Australia. Um, and so green colours are where we've got above um, the mean rainfall, brown colours are where we've got below the mean rainfall, and that grey shading is showing some of the major droughts that we've had in southeast Australia, including the current drought. Um, and one of the striking things in, in this graph um, is that of the, the last um, 25 or so years in southeast Australia, 19 of those have had below average rainfall. Um, but, um, and, and so, so what, what's been really unusual in that period of time is the, the absence of wet years. Um, so the only real wet years um, in this um, in this this most sort of recent few decades has been the the 2010-2011 La Nina event and then the 2016 negative IOD event. Um, so I just wanted to show this just to to show sort of that when we think about these um, these variability um, these modes of variability and how they affect Australia, it's not just about um, the the dry conditions that they bring when we have a positive Indian Ocean dipole event or an El Nino event, but also the importance of those opposite phases for, for breaking those droughts and bringing good rain across the country. Um, Narrowly, yes. can, I, can I ask a question from the chat box? Cindy yes. has, um, so Cindy farms near Corrigan in Western Australia. She's just put a question in there in relation to the strong negative IOD events and has just noted that in 2016, in particular, Southwest WA had over 20 frost events. So we talk about um, the importance of the, the negative IOD in terms of um, giving us that opportunity for a little bit more rainfall. But do we know any correlation or is there one between the frost events that are occurring? Um, yeah, so, so I didn't sort of show the, the plots here for the, the minimum temperatures, but yes, there is an effect on minimum temperature um, from the Indian Ocean dipole. Um, and, and just in, in general, um, there's a tendency that when we um, have uh, wet conditions, we also tend to have cooler conditions as well, um, just because of where, where well, it's, it's a couple of factors it's to do with where um, air masses are coming from, but it also means that if we have a wet environment, then we can take up more um, heat um, through evaporation. And so that means that the air doesn't warm up as much as well. Um, so so that there is a link there. Um, and and we, we have in the past tended to, to focus on things like um, the Indian Ocean Dipole and their effect on rainfall, but they do also have a strong effect on temperature as well. Are you happy with, with that response? Are there any other questions or do you want me to continue? Does anyone want to pop a quick question in or happy to keep going? Yep, might keep going nearly. Thank you for addressing that one. Yeah, no problem. Um, right, so, so just a, a summary um, of the Indian Ocean Dipole. So it is a natural climate phenomenon. Um, this is something that's um, isn't something that just happens because of the way that humans are altering the climate. Um, so it's one of our natural climate drivers. Um, the positive events tend to be stronger than the negative ones, but the negative ones are still um, quite important, particularly for, for breaking droughts. Um, when we have these events, um, they typically begin in around May to June, and they peak in about October to November, and then they rapidly decline. So this is a climate feature that um, particularly affects the, the winter, the, sorry, the, the winter and the spring. Um, and when, when you have, event, have an event, um, it will decay once you move into the summer. Um, and the, it impacts temperature and rainfall across um, Southern Australia and particularly um, into the Southeast of Australia. Right, so, so getting on to sort of the, the research that um, I've been looking at, 
Um, so I just wanted to, to address sort of a couple of the, the big sort of questions that we were wanting to, to look at with this. So, so one of the questions was, are positive Indian Ocean dive elements becoming more frequent um, and becoming more intense? Um, so this is something that's been suggested based on um, instrumental um, data um, over the, the 20th century. Uh, the problem is that we don't really have good long um, instrumental records um, for the Indian Ocean. So we've got very good um, sea surface temperature data from 1982 onwards, once we've got, had the, the satellite monitoring um, coming into to the instrumental record. Um, we think that the, the sea surface temperature record is reliable back to about 1958 in the Indian Ocean. Um, but when we go further back in time than that, um, there's really not a lot of actual measurements that were going into the sea surface temperature products for the Indian Ocean. Um, so so the, that instrumental record suggests that since the 1960s, we've had um, more frequent positive events and the events that we've had have become stronger, um, but we're really not confident um, in how reliable that instrumental record is before 1960. Um, the, the other um, source of information that we can look at um, is to go into to climate model simulations. And again, when we, when we go and look at climate models, um, they suggest that you would expect that during the 20th century, um, positive Indian Ocean dipole events um, should have started to become um, more frequent because of human caused climate change. Um, but again, we've got some pretty serious questions about um, how much we trust climate models for the Indian Ocean. So there's certain aspects of the, the Indian Ocean that we know models don't get right. Um, and so how much do we trust um, that those, um, what those models are simulating is correct? Um, and so, so what we wanted to do here was to bring in another form of evidence um, to see whether that backs up those, um, those bits of information that we we're getting from the instrumental data and from climate models. Um, if we looked at paleoclimate data, um, did that um, help to, to make it clear whether we could trust the, those other information sources or not? Uh, so what we've been doing in this study um, is to work in this area um, called the Southern Mentawai Islands. So the Mentawai Islands are a chain of islands um, around about 100 kilometers offshore of Sumatra um, in the, the Eastern Indian Ocean. So it's shown by this star here um, and the background here, the colors on this map are the ocean surface temperature anomalies for the 3rd of October last year. Um, so, so what you can see in this image is that when we have one of these positive Indian Ocean dipole events and the Eastern Indian Ocean becomes very cool, um, this study area um, is sort of right in the heart of where we see um, that cooling signal. And what's going on um, there when we have a positive Indian Ocean dipole event is that we have the winds that run along the coast of Java and Sumatra become stronger than usual, the trade winds. Um, and, and what that does is that it forces um, the water off the coast of Java and Sumatra um, to move towards the center of the eastern, of the, the center of the Indian Ocean um, and to, to fill the space that's been left as that water moves towards the center of the ocean, um, it pulls up subsurface water and that subsurface water is cooler um, than, the, than the surface of the ocean. And so that's why we get this cool anomaly developing here. And so, so we, we chose this study site um, specifically to be able to look um, for these characteristic um, cool ocean temperature anomalies that are associated with the positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, so what we were using to go back in time um, were coral samples. Um, so, so this is uh, an example of the, the type of work that we do. Um, so um, this is a coral, um, this is from the, the Eastern Indian Ocean from Christmas Island, this particular coral. Um, and um, these, the, the type of coral that we use are called parietes. They're these very sort of big um, blocks of coral. They look a little bit like a, a brown sort of cauliflower underwater. Um, and this, this um, sample that you can see here, this, um, this coral colony um, has probably been growing for about 150 years. So every year that this coral is, um, is growing um, in that reef environment, um, it grows around about 
um, a centimetre per year. And they, they grow a lot like a tree. So as a tree grows for every year that it's alive, um, we have a growth ring. Um, the same thing happens with these, with these corals. And so what we can do is to go and drill through that old um, skeleton. So the coral is only alive on the very outer surface. Um, and so what we do is we go and we drill a core down through one of these, co these corals um, and go back through those growth bands. And so by doing that, we can, can build up a, a record um, of the, that records sort of the conditions that the coral was growing in. And so, so these corals, the skeleton is made out of calcium carbonate. Um, I promise I'm not going to go too much into the chemistry, um, but for people who are, who are interested um, in, in this, the, the main um, climate measurement that, or the, the proxy that we've been using um, is to look at how heavy those atoms of oxygen are within that calcium carbonate skeleton. And so what we're doing there is we're measuring the ratio of oxygen that weighs, has an atomic mass of 18 compared to um, oxygen that has an atomic mass of 16. Um, and, and that varies um, based on how much rainfall we're getting over the reef environment. Um, and then the amount, um, that, the amount of oxygen 18 that the coral takes into its skeleton is directly proportional to the temperature of the ocean. Um, those things in the tropical ocean um, go hand in hand. So when we have those cool sea surface temperature anomalies, we also have very dry conditions um, and, and that pushes our um, oxygen isotope um, signal in the, in the same direction. So that's, the, that's what we're doing with these corals. Um, and so here's just a, another sort of example. Um, so this is um, again an, a, a, an image of a diver underwater drilling a core through one of these corals. Um, we get that core, we cut a slab um, of it and we take it just to the, the local um, medical center and they take an x-ray of it um, and we use that to, to look at the, the growth um, banding and then to, to decide um, where we want to sample that. Uh, we can sample them at really sort of fine detail so um, we can use that coral to then get a record um, at around about sort of weekly to monthly resolution um, looking at the geochemistry um, this plot here is showing um, in blue is the oxygen isotope ratio that we get from this coral. Um, and in red is um, a, another measurement that we can take the strontium calcium ratio. Um, and then just to plot over to the top, um, black um, here now is the, um, the instrumental sea surface temperature record from the, the site where this coral was taken. Um, this is actually um, a coral from the, the Mentawai Islands, and so you can see that really big peak in 1994. That was the, the positive Indian Ocean dipole event in 1994 when we had that really cool um, temperature um, off the coast of Sumatra. Um, you can see that the, the other one in the instrumental record in 1997, and this is a coral um, that died during that 1997 event. Um, are there any questions at this point? I can see a couple of things. In there. Nearly. There's one from Rick, who's down near Stanthorpe on the border. Um, and Rick's just put the question that previously we all used to keep an eye on the El Nino La Nina dynamic as an insight into the next season. Is it the case now that the IOD is more dominant and therefore a better indicator for farmers to be keeping an eye on? And I know Pete Thompson up at Roma has also put a comment around um, the IOD being a, a better indicator than the SOI. Um, I think that that partly depends on where you are. So if you were um, in Queensland, then probably the, um, the El Nino is going to be more of an influence for you um, than the, the Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, if you're in the southwest, the, the southeast of Australia, so sort of parts of New South Wales and Victoria, um, then um, you really do have an interaction there um, between um, the Indian Ocean Dipole you've also got what's happening in the Pacific, but you've also then got what's happening in the Southern Ocean as well with the, the Southern Annular Mode. Um, so that's one of, that's one of the, the reasons why, um, I guess when we have questions about why have we had a drought in Southeastern Australia, it's not sort of necessarily a, a simple question to, to answer because we've got so many different factors that play into um, the, the climate in that part of Australia. 
Um, and so we can have, for example, um, the drought that we've had since 2017 um, looks like um, probably what we were looking at is a succession um, of different climate features, um, which meant that we had this run of a number of years where we didn't have good rainfall. Um, with 2019, um, the Indian Ocean Dipole being one of the factors that was that was playing out then. Um, so yeah, so so the, the question is, the, the answer to the question is quite nuanced. It depends on where you are. Um, but I think one thing that we are seeing is that probably the Indian Ocean has more of an influence than what we previously realised. And that's partly because um, we've had so few of these big events to really sort of study. Um, and we've been studying this climate feature for a lot less. But it is something that the, the Bureau um, does include as part of their um, part of their, their climate drivers that they're really monitoring because they know that it has, has an effect. And Nerly, there's another question from Steve Hobbs, who farms Danny Caniva in Victoria. And Steve sort of made a comment, but it's really caught my interest. The point that he's made is that the worst droughts that he's experienced in that region um, are a combination of a negative IOD and an El Nino year. And he's also noted that these also coincide with very low ozone concentrations. Are you able to, I guess, provide comment on, oops, sorry, back the dog, on Steve's um, question there? Um, so, um, so a negative IOD, um, I guess we would expect that to sort of have, have um, a, a wetter condition. So, so um, and I guess noting as well, as well that the negative events tend to be a lot, um, a lot weaker than the, the positive events. So um, in that situation, probably, um, yes, that's where um, El Nino events have been sort of more important. Um, and the, the ozone one is interesting, and, and I guess that's, um, that's another interesting thing that we saw play out in 2017, was that we had um, quite a rare event over Antarctica where the polar vortex um, in the springtime broke down um, very quickly. Um, and so, so what that does is that it um, pushes, the, the, west, it pushes the, the southern annular mode into a negative phase. Um, which moves the, the um, southern hemisphere westerlies further north. Um, and so that was um, one of the major influences that we saw in northern New South Wales um, last year that contributed to the bush, bushfire risk as well, um, where we saw a lot of frontal activity coming across Australia. So a lot of those cold fronts were um, ahead of the fronts, they were drawing hot, dry air from across um, Australia towards the east coast. Um, and then um, the, the, the fronts coming through um, and not having any rain because that, that air that was um, being drawn into them was so dry. So that was where we saw an interaction between what was going on in the Indian Ocean um, and also, oops, sorry, um, also what was happening in Antarctica. Um, so I'm not sure if that was a great answer to that question. <laughs> um, yeah. Steve, did you want to comment? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I, I, none of the data I've seen so far, I'm on the Darling Downs of Queensland, none of the data that I've seen so far suggests that it's got a significant impact here. And in fact, I would argue that it, it rarely overpowers ENSO here. Uh, the only real rain we've had from the Indian Ocean, and basically we've lost that rainfall in the last 10 or 15 years anyhow, and I think the mechanism is something to do with uh, Asian do uh, aerosols. Uh, most of the rain falls in the Pilbara and down the Tanami before it gets to us. And that's why we've got a lot less uh, winter cropping on the Darling Downs because we're just not getting the rain through the winter. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and I, I, I'd just like you to conform or deny my perception there, but uh, I don't really see it having watched it for 40 or 50 years as a significant thing to, to change over to using where I am. I don't, and I would argue that uh, ENSO is much more powerful in this situation here. You might yeah. be aware that ENSO uh, is quite a sig significant sig signal to all about Charleville. And then by the time uh, Birdsville's big droughts are typically when it's neither El Nino or La Nina, for example. 
whereas for the rest of us, uh, uh, an El Nino certainly dries it out for us. Uh, yeah, we don't absolutely. very often. I, I can leave it at that if you. Um, yeah, no, I, I would just confirm. Um, yeah, your your intuition there in that. Yeah, for for Queensland, um, El Nino is definitely sort of more of an influence than the Indian Ocean Dipole. So what we see for the Indian Ocean Dipole is that the the rainfall that comes across Australia um, tends to come through in these northwest cloud bands, and so um, you can see those. Um, on the the, um, the satellite map sometimes when, when these are active, um, that you have sort of these bands of cloud that stretch um, from sort of the Kimberley area um, all the way down towards um, Victoria. And so that's the that's the area where you really have a strong um, rainfall impact. Um, and so that, that sort of northwest um, pattern um, doesn't tend to sort of push into Queensland as much. Yes, thank you. And and I know the Pilbara rainfall has been increasing for 20 years or so. Now have a look at Patchar, for example. It used to have a long-term median of two inches, and it's been quite a bit higher ever since, uh, for probably 15 years, 10 or 15 years. Yeah, so I get that there are some, some different things going on there as well. So um, when we start to look at the northern parts of Australia, um, we start to be getting into some summer-dominated rainfall. Um, and so the, the Indian Ocean Dipole really isn't a dominant influence um, in those seasons. Um, so it tends to, to have its strongest impact in the, in the winter and spring. Um, and so we see that um, across the, the southern parts of Australia where you have sort of more winter dominated rainfall. Yeah, thank you. And the only other comment I'd just like to make, I, I see ENSO as being an Indian Ocean Pacific Ocean event, really, they're, they're, in, they're both involved. Uh, rather than just the Pacific. Thank you. Yeah, that definitely, and that's that's something that our research has shown as well, is that they, they are quite closely linked. Cool, so I'll keep on going um, and actually get on to, to some of the, the results that we've got. Um, so so I showed some, some pictures before of the, the type of work that we've done um, using um, underwater corals. So they're corals that are living on the reef at the time. Um, and so we can go back sort of 150, 200 years using those types of corals. Um, to go back further in time, we have to start um, looking at fossil corals. And so these are a couple of examples of fossil corals um, that we've drilled in Indonesia. Um, in Indonesia, of course, there's, there's a lot of um, earthquakes and tsunamis. Um, and what that does is that it rips up corals um, that are growing in the reef environment and sort of throws them up onto beaches or takes the entire reef um, and moves it up above sea level. And so around the coast of Indonesia, we can find um, fossil corals of all sorts of ages. And so those are the types of samples that we've been using in this study to go further back in time in reconstructing the Indian Ocean Dipole. So, so this is, this is the, the reconstruction um, that we have um, so far. So this is work that was published just a few weeks ago in Nature. Um, the, these, this blue line, um, blue squiggly line, um, probably doesn't mean much um, to anyone just looking at it, but this is just showing the data that we've got. Um, you can see that there are gaps in the data and that's just showing periods of time where we haven't found those fossil corals yet of the right age to be able to fill those gaps. Um, but we do have um, across um, this data, um, 500 years of Indian Ocean Dipole um, data now um, based on um, our coral reconstructions from, from off the coast of Sumatra. Um, so, so a bit of interpretation on this. Um, so we can go through this record and we can see when the reconstruction is exceeding those thresholds that would indicate that we've got a positive Indian Ocean Dipole event or an extreme positive Indian Ocean Dipole event. Um, and so what we can see is that extreme events like what we saw in 2019 have historically been very rare. So across 500 years of data, we only detect 10 occurrences of those events. Um, but what we can also see is that four of those events have occurred since the 1960s. Um, so when we look at that instrumental record and we, and we see that it seems since the 1960s that there has been um, these events have been unusually common. Um, when we look across 500 years of data, um, we also get that same picture that these are, have been rare events, but they appear to be becoming more common now. Um, so we can, we can look at that um, in a different way. So this is where we um, take 
30 year windows of that data and we count up how many of these positive events or how many of those extreme positive events have we had um, in each of those 30 year windows. Um, and so what you can see um, is a natural variability, natural fluctuation of these events. Um, and then we can see in the, the most recent part of the record um, that we're now either at a level for positive events um, where we've got the, the most frequent events of any time in what we've reconstructed over the last millennium. Um, and for extreme positive events, um, we're um, at a level that's equivalent to the highest that we've seen in the past 1,000 years or that 500 years of data that we have for the last millennium. Um, right, and so, so what we can do then is to, to compare that with what we see from climate model simulations, um, both for the historical period, um, but also then looking forward if we run those climate models into the future, um, in this case using a, a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Um, so scientifically we'd refer to that as an RCP 8.5 scenario. Um, it doesn't matter if that doesn't mean um, anything to you, but this is this is our um, sort of high end. If we if we don't do anything to to reduce greenhouse gas um, emissions, this is the trajectory that we're on. Um, and so what we what you can see um, is across our coral data, our instrumental data, and our um, climate models, we start to have this consistent picture that we're seeing an increase in positive events. We're seeing more of the extreme events. Um, and that's a trajectory that we expect to continue um, with human caused climate change um, under a high greenhouse gas emission future. And so by the, the end of the century, if we continue on this high pathway, um, the, the average of these climate models um, would be suggesting that we'd be expecting to see positive events happening um, roughly one every two to three years. Um, and that we would expect to have an extreme event roughly once every five years of, of those positive events that we're ha having. Um, so that's kind of the, the where we can now look at what's our range of natural variability. Um, and when we combine all that together, we can see that we are changing the system um, and we are moving it um, into um, an area that we haven't experienced before. Um, so, so one of the, the other questions that we wanted to ask um, were uh, the most extreme events that we've experienced um, in recent decades. So events like 1997 and 2019, are they the strongest events that are possible? Um, and so um, obviously 2019, um, there were major um, impacts of that, um, particularly um, in southeastern Australia with the bushfires that we saw. Um, that came along after the, the very dry and hot conditions. Um, there has been work to say that in Victoria, um, the worst bushfire seasons tend to follow um, times when you've had a positive Indian Ocean dipole event. Um, and then we've also got the, the impacts that we see um, in Africa as well, where they've had um, very heavy rains um, and then faced locust plagues um, associated with those very heavy rains. So the, these events can have um, some very extreme impacts. Um, so um, important to take a look at whether um, our short instrumental record tells us the full range of what is possible. Um, and so what I wanted to, to point out um, here um, is just to, to highlight, um, you can see here the, the magnitude of 1997 event in our reconstruction. Um, compared to this one event that we reconstructed in 1675, um, which is much larger. Um, so if we go and zoom in um, to the, the detail that we reconstruct from the, the corals, um, you can see the 1997 event at the top there, um, and then 1675, um, which is the, the largest event that we've reconstructed in the last millennium. And so the, the peak anomaly of this event suggests that it was um, around about 30% stronger um, to about 40% um, stronger than 1997, if you take sort of the, the average across that full July to December interval. Um, so we don't have historical records from Australia to be able to sort of see um, what sort of impact did this have. We would expect that it would have had a major impact. 
Um, but we do have information that we can find in historical documents um, from Indonesia and other parts of, of Asia. Asia. Um, and so 1675 does stand out um, in those historical um, documents as um, being recorded as an extreme drought in Sumatra. There were rice fa failures and famine across Indonesia um, and also simultaneous crop failures in Thailand and India, which meant that they couldn't import um, um, crops or, or food into Indonesia to, to help um, alleviate the famine there. Um, importantly, this is a, an event where um, a lot of these um, historical crisis events um, have been linked to El Nino events in the past. Um, this was an event that couldn't be linked to an El Nino event. There was no evidence of an El Nino event. And so here we see that um, this was a case where the Indian Ocean was really sort of in overdrive and had some, some major impacts on the region. Um, so, so a quick summary um, of where we're up to. So um, with this new data, so all of our lines of evidence, so the paleoclimate data, the instrumental data and the models, um, even with the, the uncertainties that we have in those individual forms of evidence, they're all telling the same story. So they're all indicating that positive Indian Ocean dipole events are becoming stronger um, and they're happening more often. Um, from our reconstruction, we can also see that it's possible for the Indian Ocean to generate even stronger variability than what has so far been measured. So I think that's something that um, scientifically we need to, to um, keep that in mind when we're thinking about the, the impacts of these events and being aware that the instrumental record doesn't necessarily tell us about the full range of the impacts that they may have. Um, and we expect that the Indian Ocean Dipole um, is going to play an increasingly important role in Australia's climate variability in the future, um, particularly if we continue on a high emission pathway. Um, so um, so what, what, can, uh, what can we do? Um, so I did mention that, so the Bureau of Meteorology does use the Indian Ocean Dipole in their, um, their climate outlooks. Um, so this is the, the most recent climate um, the climate model summary issued just a couple of days ago. Um, so this is, this is a bit of good news um, in that at the moment it looks like um, the Indian Ocean Dipole is pushing towards um, a tendency to go to the negative state for this current um, winter and spring. Um, there is some, some caution in that and that typically this is a quite a hard time of year um, for making predictions of the Indian Ocean Dipole and El Nino. Typically, once we get through into May, we start to have a clearer indication as to, to whether um, either of these climate modes is going to um, move into a positive or a negative state. Um, so it's still quite early to, to have a lot of confidence about this, but at least um, it, the needle's not pointing towards um, another positive Indian Ocean Dipole event this year. Um, so this is one thing that we can do is to, to look at, um, to take, take note of the Indian Ocean Dipole um, in those long range forecasts that are put out. Um, scientifically, um, we've got work to do to improve um, those long range forecasts and, and to, to see if we can overcome some of those barriers that we have um, to sort of predicting sort of more than a few months out. Um, and then I just wanted to, to finish up with this. Um, this is a type of image that you may or may not have seen before. So this is called a climate stripes diagram. Uh, so this is a, a, um, a visualization of global average temperature um, from 1850 through to the end of 2019. Um, and so, so in these climate stripes, um, every year is given a color based on um, the global temperature. Um, we set the period from 1850 to 1900 as having a, an average temperature of zero degrees. So this is our, what we call pre-industrial. Um, and so this is the period of time where we hear about the Paris Agreement and trying to limit warming to um, no more than two degrees above pre-industrial. Um, that 1850 to 1900 is that pre-industrial level. Um, and so, at, at 2019, we're, we're sat with global warming um, at a little bit over one degree above that pre-industrial level. 
Um, if we go and look at our climate models um, going through to the end of 2100, um, this is what that climate stripes diagram looks like if we choose a high emission pathway as opposed to a low emission pathway. Um, and basically across um, pretty much every um, aspect of the climate system, a low emission pathway um, has lower climate risks associated with it compared to a higher emission pathway. Um, the same is true for the Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, so in that top panel, um, this is just showing um, the frequency of extreme positive Indian Ocean Dipole events. Um, so you can see that continuous increase if we continue on a high greenhouse gas emission future. Um, if on the other hand, we choose that low greenhouse gas emission future, so RCP 2.6, um, we still see that increase in events becoming more frequent um, during the, the 20th century and into the start of this century, but then we see a leveling off um, of that. So, so this is a change where we do expect that positive Indian Ocean Dipole events will continue to become more frequent, um, but we can limit um, how much um, that, that change can, um, how, how much we let that, that change um, continue on, on for. Right, um, so that was, that was it in terms of the, the presentation. Happy to take questions. Thanks so much for that, Neralee. That was fascinating. So we've got a question from Peter over in the southwest of WA. Um, and Peter's question has been, this may or may not be related to the IOD, but considering the huge impact of uh, the climate change induced wobble of the, or the Arctic vortex has in the Northern Hemisphere, has the Antarctic vortex had an impact on our weather? And specifically, has it or will it have an impact on the IOD? Yeah, that's a, a really fascinating question. Um, something, something that we're working on um, in, in, my, in my research team to try and understand that from sort of a last millennium perspective. Um, so, so what we're seeing um, with Antarctica um, is that the, the southern annular mode is becoming more positive. Um, and so, so what that means is that um, the, the mid-latitudes have been warming up faster um, than Antarctica. So we're increasing the temperature gradient, um, which is increasing, um, causing a positive southern annular mode, which means that the westerly winds shift further, further south. Um, so for, for Southwest WA, where there's been that really drastic decline um, in winter rainfall, um, that's an effect of the, the southern annular mode and those westerly winds shifting further south. So, so the rainfall that would normally come on those westerlies, um, the westerlies are still carrying rainfall, it's just that it's not hitting Australia because it's sitting too far south. Um, so, um, so into the future, um, we do expect that in winter, um, the southern annular mode will continue to become more positive, excuse me. Um, in the summer, it's, it's a, an interesting um, trade-off between the recovery of the ozone hole um, and those increasing greenhouse gases. So in the long term, um, we do expect that the greenhouse gases are going to win um, that, that tug of war. And so we will see that positive trend continuing in the summer as well. Um, but at the moment where we've got ozone recovery, we're also seeing um, a slowdown in that positive trend. And we would expect, expect that for, for a few decades um, or so. Um, so so it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, the, the interactions are, are really interesting. There's definitely an interaction between the El Nino and the Southern Annular Mode. There's probably an interaction with the Indian Ocean, but we're still trying to understand it. Thanks, Neralee. And Lucinda, who is uh, not too far from Holbrook in New South Wales, has put a question around what was the modelled temperature increase in the low emissions future with the modelled effects of the IOD? Um, yeah, so, so that um, the RCP 2.6, that low emissions scenario, um, under that scenario, we end up with a, around about a two-thirds chance of limiting global average warming to um, two degrees. Um, in the, that high emission scenario, we're talking about more like four to five degrees of warming by the, the end of the century, and that being a, a, a continuing trend um, beyond 2100 as well. Um, yeah, so, so sort of a, a quick 
answer on that in terms of what those global temperature levels compare to. Beautiful. Do we have any more questions that people haven't put in the chat boxes yet? Oh, sorry, Nick's got one. So Nick's put a question around, do the ocean heat waves that we are seeing cause the bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef, do they have any potential to break down the positive IOD or El Nino events? Um, I think that they're probably more of a, a side effect um, of those. So yeah, so marine heat waves um, are something that we're seeing happening everywhere in the ocean. Um, when we, when we have the, those marine heat waves over a coral reef, that's when we get coral bleaching. Um, but we also see the impacts in places like offshore of Tasmania, um, the impact that that has, has on the, the kelp forests there um, and on the, the aquaculture industry. Um, yeah, so, um, so certainly the, the, um, the El Nino and the Indian Ocean dipole will have an influence um, in any given year. So for example, when you have one of these positive Indian Ocean dipole events, um, like what's shown on the screen here, and you have those cool ocean temperatures off the coast of Java and Sumatra, um, those reefs in that year um, are gonna be sitting in relatively cool water. And so they won't be um, under that same risk of bleaching. Um, but if you turn that around um, and move into a negative Indian Ocean dipole event, that water becomes warmer. And so you increase the risk of bleaching. Um, so, so it's more, it's more the, those um, climate modes affecting your chance of, of having a marine heat wave and the bleaching in that reef environment rather than the other way around. Thanks, Nerali. And Nerali, we've got a couple more flowing through, which is great. And Charlie has put one which is very close to my heart at the moment. My home farm was decimated and the childhood home destroyed about six weeks ago through a mini cyclone in WA. And so Charlie's question has actually been, do you have any data on the relationship or a relationship between the IOD and cyclones in the Indian Ocean? Um, not directly. Um, there, there is a link with, with El Nino, but generally what we see um, is that when we have um, warmer water, then we're more likely to have have cyclones. And so, so what we saw in the Indian Ocean in this last year is that once the, once the, um, well, so, so when we had the positive Indian Ocean dipole event happening, um, the Eastern Indian Ocean was unusually cool, but the Western Indian Ocean was unusually warm. And so there were places in Eastern Africa um, and, and up into the, the Middle East that experienced cyclones there where they wouldn't normally have experienced cyclones. And that was because you had those warm ocean temperatures. Um, and then what we saw once the Indian Ocean Dipole um, broke down um, in December, um, that allowed the Eastern Indian Ocean to start warming up. And that's where we started to see cyclones then developing um, off the Northwest of Australia. And that's um, one, of the, one of the factors that contributed to that rain that came through in February um, and finally sort of put out the fires in Eastern Australia as well. Um, so yes, there, there is a link um, between um, these events, um, it's, but it's better studied so far for El Nino um, and showing sort of the link between El Nino and La Nina years in terms of where you're getting cyclones and how, um, how frequent you expect cyclones to be that year. Yes, fantastic. Nearly, I'm just very conscious of time, so we might take three more questions if that's okay, so we don't yeah. keep you too late. Um, so we've got a question about the, the physical mechanism by which a positive IOD affects Southwest Australian temperature. Um, yeah, so, so again, so what we have um, when we have a positive Indian Ocean dipole event, there's, there's two, two factors that are, that are going on there in terms of the, the temperature, um, particularly into, into Southwest Australia. Um, so what you can see, um, it's actually quite nicely shown on this image is we, when we talk about the Indian Ocean Dipole, we talk about positive events having cool ocean temperatures in the, the Eastern Indian Ocean, Eastern Tropical Indian Ocean and warm ocean temperatures in the West. So we talk about that East-West gradient, um, but those warm temperatures in the West um, tend to sort of have a horseshoe pattern around the cool anomaly. And so you can see those, that warm water that sits um, off the, the Southern coast of Western Australia. So you've got typically during these events, um, quite warm water off the southern 
um, parts of Australia. So that will make the climate um, onshore a lot warmer. Um, the other thing that's happening is that we've got um, the air that's drawn down from the northwest across Australia um, being very dry. Um, and so when we have that, that dry air, we're not able to take up as much, we're not, not able to, to transfer as much of the, the incoming radiation that we get from the sun. Um, we can't change, take up that energy through evaporation because we've got very dry air. And so that allows that air to, to heat up more. Um, so, so it takes that energy and, and puts it into changing the temperature of the air rather than evaporating water instead. Fascinating. Um, so nearly just a couple more. We've got, so um, Pete's raised the question of the, the depth, does the depth or the volume of the Indian Ocean alter its heating potential? I understand the Indian Ocean's relatively shallow as oceans go. So does it alter its heating potential under global warming and will this affect um, current circulation and therefore the IOD strength and impact? Is that able to be modelled at this point? Um, it can be, it can be modelled. Um... The Indian Ocean is actually one of the, the ocean basin that's warming sort of faster than any other, any of the other basins. Um, but generally, um, yeah, when we're talking about sort of ocean heating, we're talking about sort of the upper, um, the upper sort of 100 metres or so of the ocean, and then that gradually sort of gets circulated into deeper levels of the ocean. Um, the ocean is enormous, and so it's able to take up a, a huge amount of heat, um, and it does take up a huge amount of heat. Um, but what we're seeing in the in the surface ocean is that the so the Indian Ocean um, is warming very fast, but it's warming faster in the western um, side of the Indian Ocean to the eastern side. Um, so so we're seeing sort of a it, sort of the average condition of the Indian Ocean moving towards this sort of more positive Indian Ocean dipole state, and that's one of the factors that means that we're seeing these um, these events happening more often because of the way that um, global warming isn't warming all of the ocean in the same at the same rate. So parts of the, the ocean are warming faster, including the Western Indian Ocean. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. And Roger um, has raised the question of: Do we have any suspected drivers for the frequent IOD negative events in the late 1600s? Um, I think so. I think that was the, the positive events. So, so I think in the in the 1600s where we have that sort of blip. Um, where we, we saw um, a lot of positive events and we saw that particularly strong um, 1675 event. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so this was part of the, the natural variability that we can expect. So it was a period of time um, that you'll sometimes hear referred to as the, the Little Ice Age. Um, so generally, climate was cooler at this time. Um, but what happened in terms of the, the average climate was that the the, the oceans around Indonesia cooled more than other places. So again, um, like how I was talking about um, at the moment, we're pushing the Indian Ocean towards a more positive Indian Ocean-like mean state because we're warming the Western Indian Ocean faster than the East. In that period of time, we cooled the Eastern Indian Ocean more than the West. And so the effect was the same in terms of um, changing that ocean temperature gradient. So it was more like a positive Indian Ocean mean state and made it easier to have those individual events. So different, different process, a different mechanism um, with the, the same effects on making those events more common. Thank you, Nerele. And final question before we, we wrap up and let you go for the night. Um, this one comes from Carl Young, who's down in the Mildura region. And Carl's question is sort of looking to the future a bit more rather than the past. And he's raised the point of if geoengineering occurs, i.e. the sulfur dioxide proposals, will the deposits be spread around or would it be localised? And if localised, would it be likely deposited in the southern hemisphere? So a little bit different to our previous conversation, but would love your thoughts on it. Um, yeah, so, so the, the idea of um, putting some of the sulfur um, into the, the atmosphere, so it's kind of simulating what we would have if we have a very large volcanic eruption. So to get that climate effect, you really need to push, um, do that, inject that very high in the atmosphere. So like when you have a very big volcanic eruption, um, once you have sulfur up into that level of the atmosphere, it does sort of spread 
um, all around the globe. And so we would expect the fallout to be seen all around the globe. And that's actually one of the, the interesting ways um, that um, as climate scientists that we reconstruct um, when these big eruptions have gone off in the past. And quite often these are tropical eruptions. Um, but what we see um, is we see those sulfur deposits um, in Greenland ice cores and Antarctic ice cores. And, and we see them in, in both of those ice cores at the same period of time, indicating that, that sulfur has gone all the way around the world. So injected at the tropics, um, but then falling out all across the world. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Nerali. Um, just before I hand back to Lucinda to do a thank you, I'll just acknowledge the other members of our team that are on tonight. So we've got Wendy Cole, an FCA's CEO, who has joined us, which is wonderful. And we've also got James Atkinson. And then we've had farmers from all around Australia. So it's been fantastic. And Nerali, thank you for, um, for agreeing to do this. Lucinda, over to you for the formal thanks. <laughs> Oh, look, Nerali, thank you so much for sharing, uh, well, firstly, uh, your work over a thousand years, which is stunning, really, just getting the understanding of um, some of the work you're doing in the Mentawi Islands and um, those coral cores and thinking about what might happen with these models for the next um, 80 years, which always sort of sets me back in my tracks when I think about my family and, and um, the sixth generation, my granddaughter's now born, and thinking about them still being alive in 2100. So it spurs us on to do what we do and to, to find a way to, to um, convince, I guess, the rest of society <laughs> that we need to, um, to embark upon a low emissions future. But so interesting. Thanks so much for sharing. And I'm sure everybody tonight was delighted to have the chance to talk with you and listen to your experience. And congratulations on the paper for nature. That's just fabulous. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Listen, just before we go, um, we're just about to put a poll up on your screen. We just This is the first in our series of webinars, everyone. We'd really love your insights on how we can do this better, how we can best meet the, um, the needs of our audience, particularly in relation to time, because it's a very live issue within our team. So if you could just quickly answer those two questions, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks, Verity. Thanks so much for organising with everybody. That was just really worthwhile and, um, yeah, gives us a whole new perspective on what we're seeing every day out in the paddock. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks again, Nerali. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.